Eurodynamics, a series of pages, a number of graphical patterns, complex numbers, and difficult terminologies. Tell me, who is not scared of interpreting it? Let's try to make it easy today. Five things we are going to cover in this session. Number one, what is a Eurodynamic study? What actually are we testing in this test? What are the various components of Eurodynamic evaluation? How does a test looks like when it is normal? And how to interpret if there is any abnormality? First question is, what is Eurodynamics? Definition-wise, it is a set of tests to measure lower urinary tract functions. And lower urinary tract means bladder and the urethra. The goal here is to reproduce physiology of this lower urinary tract in order to identify the underlying symptoms and the disease. In simple words, we are trying to artificially create the same situation as in normal life. Say, by filling the bladder and asking patient to cough or asking her to void. And what are we recording is the pressure changes in bladder and urethra during this entire process. But remember, it is not 100% sensitive as it is not always possible to artificially create the same situation as in real life. An important factor that can interfere is the associated embarrassment of voiding on command and realizing that someone is observing it. The second question is, what are we testing? So, Lower urinary tract, that is bladder plus urethra or the outflow tract, has only two functions. Number one is to store urine and number two is to timely empty it. So it's simple that the problems will happen only in two situations. When either it fails to store correctly or it fails to empty properly. Failure of storage can be because of bladder or its outlet. Similarly, emptying issues can also be either because of bladder or its outlet. In order to understand Eurodynamics, we have to understand all of its five components in sequence. Euroflometry is the first test done. It's non-invasive. Patient is told to sit in an artificial toilet system which is connected to pressure measuring device that records the flow of urine as it falls on the device while the patient is asked to urinate in private. The flow of urine is recorded by a machine and is represented graphically. After checking the euro flow, the bladder is emptied with the help of a disposable catheter that serves two purposes. First, it measures the residual urine and second, with the help of a dipstick, presence or absence of infection is checked in that sample which we have just obtained with a disposable catheter. Now, when the bladder is totally empty, we start filling it again with saline. During this, with the help of two tiny catheters placed one inside the bladder and another in rectum, pressures are measured. I will explain it to you again in a more detailed manner. After completion of the filling phase, patient is asked to empty it or void. The pressure measured during this phase of emptying constitute what is known as a pressure flow study. At the end, in order to check the urethra, what we also call as the outlet of lower urinary tract, the bladder catheter is pulled out slowly and pressures at various points in the urethra are recorded 
at rest and during coughing. Last one in the list is electromyogram or EMG. So we will not be discussing further about this EMG in today's discussion. Simply put, it is to measure the perineal muscle activity which might interfere with other pressures and can create artifacts. Euroflowmetry meaning measurement of flow of urine. As I told you, it is an, a non-invasive procedure. Patient sits comfortably in a toilet seat and voids in private. Only difference is that the voided urine falls in a pot which has sensors to measure the pressure and interpret the flow. On the other side of the curtain, an observer can see this graph or the pattern of flow in the monitor or else can take a print also. The graph here in a normal person should look like this, a smooth bell-shaped curve. First, I will tell you the most practical thing. Euroflow alone is not a very important test in women. It's more important in men because of frequent pathologies related to prostrate causing obstruction of flow in them. Urethral and just the flow related problems are rare in women owing to the short urethra and absence of prostatic and obviously the related obstructive pathologies. It is usually done in specific circumstances where we are not expecting the common pathologies. Now if by chance you are seeing a patient and Euroflow is already being done maybe by the referring doctor, before jumping to interpret it, one word of caution, always and always first check how much volume the lady has voided. If the voided volume is less than 100 ml, the chances of interpretational fallacies are very high. Total voided volume is the area under curve in this picture. Having checked that the voided volume is more than 100 ml, look at the shape of the curve now. It should be a nice bell-shaped curve. We have to see only two numbers here. Maximum flow rate, that is Qmax, that is the peak and also the average flow rate, that is Q average. As a rule of thumb, Qmax is around two times of Q average. For example, if the average flow rate is 10 and Qmax is say 19, it's normal. 19.5, it's normal. So in a normal Euroflow, I repeat, the curve should be smooth, bell-shaped. Voided volume should be more than 100. Even to interpret the test result, Qmax should be two times that of Q average. This is a normal Euroflow. Once the patient has completed voiding on her own and we are about to start filling her bladder for systometry, the window is a good opportunity to test residual urine and rule out infections with an instant dipstick test. For systometry, imagine the patient is sitting on a urodynamic chair. As the preparation, we put one very thin catheter through her urethra into her bladder. One channel in this catheter is used for filling the bladder with saline which is hung at high level with an adjusted flow rate. The ideal flow rate should be 60 ml per minute, not too fast, not too slow. The same catheter also has a sensor to record pressures in the bladder. The second catheter is placed in rectum for measuring the abdominal pressure. This one can be put in vagina also to do the same function. But absence of an external sphincter in vagina and thus the difficulty to hold it makes rectum a better choice. So these teeny tiny catheters are recording bladder pressure which is known as P vesicle and abdominal pressure P abdomen. Imagine that the abdomen is putting up pressure 
and it is transmitted into the cavity of bladder. But there is something else also that can create pressure on bladder cavity and that is the bladder muscle or detrusor contractions. So the pressure inside the bladder actually is abdominal pressure plus detrusor pressure. But we do not have a pro for detrusor. So what can we do to get that pressure? Simply minus the abdominal pressure from the bladder pressure. I hope you understand it. I will repeat that the pressure is maximum inside the bladder because it is taking the pressure of abdomen and detrusor. Detrusor muscle has a mind of its own. Whenever it contracts, it generates a pressure. When relaxed, there is no pressure. Abdominal pressure is because of its organs, which is minimal. However, movements like valsalva or cough will increase it. All these pressures are getting recorded in a graphical fashion and is shown like this. Let's understand the graph of a CMG. Note, there are two parts here. First one is while we are filling the bladder with saline. The second part is when we order or allow the patient to void. The recordings during filling phase are basically called systometry. The recordings during the voiding phase are called flow studies or pressure flow studies. Now out of the many running lines shown in this picture, only three are important for us. Recordings from different machines may have a different arrangement and color of these lines. So first thing is to recognize which lines are P vesicle, P detrusor and P abdomen. It will be written somewhere there. Now what's happening in the real time is that where the urodynamic study is going on, the bladder is being filled at a constant rate and in intervals, patient is being asked to cough. Whenever she coughs, tell me what will happen. The intra-abdominal pressure will rise. Note the peak in the green line. We know that whenever pressure in the abdomen increases, it will be transmitted to the bladder cavity. See the corresponding peak in P vesicle line, the purple one. That's perfectly what should happen in a normal lady. Now remember what I told you, detrusor has a mind of its own and pressure in the abdomen does not influence it. See the P det line or the blue one. There is no peak. That's perfect. The second cough, same thing. The third peak, same thing. Now can you tell me what will happen when the patient has urgency or overactive bladder? While the bladder is being filled at random, the detrusor muscle will contract, which will be reflected as random peaks in P det line. What will happen to P abdomen? Nothing, as abdomen pressure is above it, but the bladder cavity is below, and we know P vesicle is sum of abdomen and detrusor pressure. So we must see a corresponding peak in P vesicle line also. This is the report of a patient in our hospital. Look at the trace. Look at the trace. P abdomen here is denoted with red line. It is almost flat, peaking with coughs. Now this peak should correspond with Peak in the bladder, yes. P vesicle, see, it is there. We can also see there is a very obvious random activity or pressure hikes in P detrusor. Looks like detrusor overactivity. To say it is real, it should correspond with which one? P vesicle. As whenever random detrusor muscle contracts, even the bladder pressure will increase. While there will be no change in the abdominal cavity pressure as it is here. I hope this is not a difficult concept for all of you to understand. Finally, for diagnosis of urgency or overactive bladder, we have to follow some rules. Even if you are in too much hurry, don't fill the bladder fast. Fast filling in some cases might provoke 
uterosa contractions which are not actually present during normal circumstances. The diagnosis is made from the filling phase. The rules to remember are in normal circumstances, P debt or detrosa pressure should be near zero. During cough also, P debt should be zero. That means it should be flat without any spikes. If there is a spike in P debt, it should mirror in P vesicle also. Urge incontinence or overactive bladder wet is diagnosed when there is a spike in P detrusor and there is leak during the filling phase itself. Now there are certain questions which we have to ask our patient while she is undergoing filling of the bladder. We must ask about the first sensation which comes around 100 ml, first urge that comes around 200 ml and the strong urge after which the patient is no more able to hold the urine or the saline in her bladder that is the strong urge which comes around 500 ml when the bladder is full. Any decrease in these values will be an added information to make a diagnosis of overactive bladder. The next condition we are interested in is the diagnosis of SUI. Remember, stress urinary incontinence is just one disease. Like urgency leading to urge incontinence, it doesn't have a pre-monetary symptomatic stage. So what we have to see is the leak. And where do we see the leak? It is in the graph showing the urine flow. In the urgency slide, I had cropped this part to keep it simple. But in SUI, we need to observe it. With cough impulse, here the patient will leak urine and how do we know that the leak is happening? It is by seeing the corresponding peak in abdominal pressure and bladder pressure. That should happen whenever the patient coughs. Let's read this real life example from one of our patients. The flow is marked here in the lower panel and the leak is graphically denoted with drops that is corresponding to the spikes in P abdomen and P vesicle with cough and pulse. I want you to focus for a minute in P detrusor also. Can you see the corresponding negative waves there? It's just a mathematical issue. We know that P detrusor is calculated by subtracting P abdomen from P vesicle. And normally if P det is not acting, P abdomen should be equal to P bladder or P vesicle. But in SUI, what happens is that because of the incompetence with cough, urethra opens to leak the urine. In that moment, bladder pressure drops. So mathematically speaking, if you minus P abdomen from P vesicle, which has dropped momentarily, you will get a negative number getting recorded by the machine as a reverse wave in P detrosa. Next is the pressure flow study. Once the bladder capacity is reached, the patient is asked to void. And how do we know that point? There are two ways. First, the patient complains of strong desire and can't hold it anymore. Or else, we stop filling once we have infused around 500 to 600 ml of saline inside the bladder. If you allow to fill it more, remember that there is a chance that a retrograde flow to the ureters can happen with over distension of bladder that remember we must avoid. So when patient starts voiding, tell me what happens the urethra opens and the bladder contracts. Bladder contracts means what? It means that the deutrosa contracts to empty the bladder. If you know this much, where to look for? Tell me, the blue line denoting the deutrosa is showing increase in pressure which 
as expected would be mirrored in bladder pressure. In a process of normal micturition, abdomen doesn't involve. Detrosa contracts and urethra opens and patient voids. A word about the shape of this curve. Do you remember similar bell-shaped curve? Where did we get? It was in uroflometry. These two are actually the same. The only difference is that uroflow was non-invasive, while here the pressure recording is done by a catheter which is placed inside. Points to remember in the pressure flow study are Number one, in normal circumstances, P abdomen should be zero. There should be no abdominal straining. If the detrosa pressure shows a low rise, that denotes areflexia. High detrosa pressures are suggestive of obstruction. Uroflometry and this pressure flow study if both are done for one particular patient, in cases of doubts, these two can be compared to rule out artifacts. Hope you guys are not very tired. The next thing I'm going to talk about is urethral pressure profile or UPP and promise that this will be the last topic for today. What is the meaning of urethral pressure profile? Urethral pressure profile is a measure of the pressures which are required to open a closed urethra. In the same catheter which is entering the bladder, there is another sensor to measure urethral pressures. With this sensor, measurement of pressure along the entire length of the urethra are done. Bladder catheter, while doing this, is slowly withdrawn that measures pressures at every point or you can say various points as it traverses the urethra. Now by the help of this sensor which is moving along the urethra what all can be measured. First is the length of urethra. Please look at the picture. Urethra length is from the point the pressure starts increasing till the point when pressure again drops down. We can also measure here urethral pressure at various points. At but what is more important is the urethral closure pressure. And urethral closure pressure is equal to urethral pressure minus the pressure inside the bladder. And from that also, the more important one is the maximum urethral closure pressure, which is also commonly known as MUCP. Just remember one thing that for a normally functioning sphincter or the normally functioning urethra, you can say this pressure should be more than 40. This urethral pressure profile, we have to check in two phases, at rest, and with cough impulses. To do the same, catheter is first pulled out that makes the wave A as it was shown earlier. It again goes inside and all these things are happening automatically with the help of the machine. We are not doing anything. Again when it is going inside, it makes the similar wave which you can see in the graph on the left hand side. Now the second time when the catheter is pulled out, patient is told to cough again and again. That creates the wave 3 you can see with pressure impulses. Now, with this, as I told you for us, important thing is urethral closure pressure that the machine calculates by subtracting the vesicle or the bladder pressure from the urethral pressure. Why are we doing this? Because there can be a patient in whom the pressures are normally at rest, but with cough, the urethra might not be able to hold it and the closure pressures drop down. And what situation is this? This is SUI. 
Fifth and the last component of a eurodynamic evaluation is the electromyogram or AMG. As I have told you before also that it is just to pick up if any accessory muscle activity happens during the eurodynamic study which might interfere with other four parameters mentioned or described before. So we would not be discussing this EMG part. And that finishes our basics in eurodynamic evaluation. I know it is a difficult topic and more so if you are not involved in doing it but are responsible to interpret the report. I hope this video helps you understand the basics of a eurodynamic study. We will soon be back with some real life traces to interpret. Till then, stay connected. If you have any doubts, please feel free to post your query in the comment box below. Thank you.